When last I shared with you a mirror two weeks ago, it was the day before Christmas, and we considered an old story anew. We started with the familiar words of the Christmas story um, in the King James Version, of course, and uh, seeing what those ancient words might still be saying to us. So we looked at the prophecy from Isaiah, for unto us a child is born. And we asked the question, have these words come to pass for you? And who are the prophets that you listen to today? We looked at the Annunciation from Luke. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast found favor with God. And the question proposed, Have you discovered God's plan for you? We looked at the dream from Matthew. Then Joseph did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and asked, where is God placing you? And are you accepting that place and its role? We looked at the journey from Luke. And Joseph also went up from Galilee. We asked, where are you on the road that God has laid out before you? We looked at the inn that crowded in from Luke, where there was no room for them. And we asked, how are you making do? The angels, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Asking, what is your response to this angel's message? And the shepherds. And they came with haste and found the babe lying in a manger. And we ask the question, where did you find Jesus? And where is he for you now? Or if you have yet to find him, where are you looking for him? You know, even excerpts of these passages, I wonder if they have the same impact that they did two weeks ago. Or do they sound all of a sudden kind of out of season? It's as though we've gotten tired of the decorations, so let's get those down and let's get back to normal life. If you were here two weeks ago, you might have noticed that we did not tell um, or describe all of the characters that are portrayed in our crash scenes. Today we will, for this is Epiphany Sunday. It's sort of the last echo of the Christmas season. But Christmas time is not over yet. In fact, uh, not certainly by the church's calendar. The season of Epiphany extends nine more weeks. In fact, it'll take us right up to Ash Wednesday and the beginning of the Lenten season. That is a significant amount of time to be celebrating anything. And I'm wondering if, if maybe because Epiphany is sort of sometimes lost in the shuffle, that we're, we're missing something about it and its significance and taking time to truly celebrate all that it represents. Epiphany is a Greek word for manifestation or for an appearance. Um, we translate it, it means to, to show forth. Specifically used in this context, it's God making himself visible in the form of, of a human being in giving us the Christ child, God incarnate, God visible. And Epiphany focuses on the last recorded visitors to the Christ child. What crash would be complete without those three wise men? And yet most Bible scholars agree that uh, they probably did not visit um, the Christ child in that manger scene that night. In fact, it was probably more like two years later that they got there. This whole season of epiphany within the church sort of got its start uh, in the Mediterranean area, and, and it was packed full of things to remember and to celebrate. So Epiphany included honoring Jesus' baptism, which some groups still do on this day. Um, it recognized the first recorded uh, miracle of Jesus, the turning water into the wine at the Cana wedding. It celebrated uh, the, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And just for good measure, they threw in that this kind of recognized the arrival, the late arrival of those magi and the gifts that they brought to the Christ child. That was sort of in the Eastern Mediterranean. By the time it got to the Western Church, to the Roman Catholic Church in the fourth century, 
um, it had lost pretty much all of those emphases except the coming of the Magi. Good old Martin Luther, the great reformer, he even tried in the 1500s to sort of get it back to what he felt was a much more significant celebration, that of, uh, of Jesus' baptism, uh, but never really accomplished that to any uh, extent. And still today, traditionally, in the Eastern Orthodox churches, January 6th, which was yesterday, uh, is still celebrated. Uh, that's kind of their Christmas, where they exchange gifts in honor of this Epiphany Day, or Three Kings Day, as it is sometimes referred to. These wise men are really uh, quite an enigma to modern Bible scholars because there's so much we don't know about them. We don't know how many there really were. We don't know where they came from. We don't even know if they were all, all men. It could have been a mixed group. But whatever the historical origins are of this particular time, Matthew includes the Magi's visit to sort of validate the identity of this uh, Bethlehem babe. We find out a lot about the, the Magi from tradition, not from scripture, but from tradition. And uh, in fact, from just tradition, we uh, believe that there were three Magi. They rode white camels. They came from all different directions. They met just outside of Jerusalem, and they found Jesus on the 12th day of their localized journey after they had met with Herod. And then they later on became the proclaimers and tellers of the story of Jesus. Scripture doesn't give us nearly as much information, but it's still rather significant. In fact, uh, Scripture references their visit in Isaiah's prophecy some 800 years earlier. And it says in the 60th chapter, Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. They shall bring gold and incense. One Bible scholar has written about them. The Magi were not kings. They were the masters of kings. The kings ruled the people, but the wise men directed the kings. They alone could communicate with the God of light. No king began a war without consulting them. In the name of science and religion, they held first rank in the nation. While not kings, they had the status of kings. Another tradition goes even further to actually name these uh, three magi. Uh, it's suggested that there was a Balthazar, who was an Ethiopian from uh, Africa to the south. There was Melchior, uh, a Hindu from India to the east. And there was Caspar, a Greek from the west. What do you suppose it took to get these three wise men to leave the security of their home in their country, to travel some of them thousands of miles across a trackless desert, to give valuable gifts to someone else's future king. On the surface, that doesn't sound like a very wise decision. But I think it might help us to understand this journey that we're on if we understood the journey that these mysterious characters were on, an ancient, Star Trek. I'll confess right now, I'm not a Star Trekky or Trekker. And uh, I must also confess that I really have had minimal interest in stargazing or astrology or any of those kinds of things. Until just a couple of weeks ago, where um, I heard about a concept it's called dark sky sights. Uh, some of you are nodding your heads of having heard about that. Uh, I had not before. There are areas which, in which they attempt to limit uh, light pollution so that you can see what, much more clearly what's in the heavens above. Um, and what struck me from this radio broadcast was uh, testimonials by folks who have been to some of these dark sites and just were floored, in fact, emotionally um, uh, about the description of what they were seeing for the first time that they never even knew existed right up above their heads, even in Northeast Ohio on cloudy, on cloudy days. Um, and it's, um, it was, they described it as a life-changing experience for them and gave them a whole new perspective of, of their life. 
a little bit of a side note, I understand that one of these sites is under construction in the Geauga Park system. I don't know if it's opened yet, but um, I'm looking forward to that to, uh, to see what they're, what they're talking about. We sometimes think as modern day folks that we have advantages over the ancients that many of these things were written for and the stories were told about um, because we know so much more. But certainly in this instance, the ancients would have been, well, of course, we see this all the time because light is so minimal, man-made light, and we're able to see these things. So when they talk about the stars and the heavens and showing the handiwork of God, we, we don't always get that because we just see a couple of major constellations perhaps and, and such. Well, until the park is developed, in the meantime, I'd like to see if we can shed some new light, pun intended, uh, on this uh, often overlooked and dismissed or rushed through part of the Christmas story. And first, it might be helpful to understand who these characters really were. Um, the Magi, there actually was a group, they were from a learned caste in a caste system in ancient Persian society. And uh, they pursued wisdom and knowledge. So they delved into the mysteries of healing, not just rejoicing when someone was healed, but how did that happen? They probed the wonders of nature. And they also sought to understand the movements of the stars and the planets uh, as well. They were thinkers and they were seekers, and they, they didn't go for the easy answers. They weren't content with sort of superficial uh, knowledge of things. The suggestion is here from historians as well that that they came from an educated people. And at this point, in, uh, around the time of the birth of, of Christ, their, um, their culture had been conquered by, they wouldn't have called them barbarians yet, but an but a ill-informed people, we might say. And so here were folks who were really probably struggling with identifying a true, worthy ruler anointed by a god. And that maybe by coming out and seeking uh, and paying homage to this new king, of whose star they were following, was a way of sort of honoring their highest ideals, and especially when, when their captors were a rather corrupt society that only valued raw power and military strength. We don't hear much about Magi today, and yet um, are there people like that? Maybe even here this morning? Well, those who seek to understand not just the mechanics of some things, but the underlying principles of, of what we do and what they do. That's what makes those pursuits come to life and really take on an extra meaning. In your profession, in your career, in your hobbies or such, that uh, to have knowledge that, that just uh, uh, impassions you and gives you a whole other perspective of just toilsome things that we do throughout the day. Those are magi. And I believe that we do do that today as well. Well, the Magi in this story uh, saw a new light and it captivated their attention. Do you ever feel called to seek something that, that inspires you or in, inquires of you to, to lift your sights higher? Maybe something like peace or justice or hope or love or truth righteousness or wisdom or, or beauty. We may do that for a moment, but then we get our feet, our eyes back down on our feet, planted firmly on the ground. It's easy to stop looking up and see stars that might be guiding us. We just keep our eyes on our feet. Just dealing with the demands that life throws at us every day is plenty. But when we remember to look up. There is a star there. It may not be the one that astrologists would net recognize, but it's there calling us to move beyond ourselves so that we can create something good and true that reflects that true nature of God. So what does it take to follow a star like that? Well, the Magi had to leave everything that they knew, everything. And you know what? It's stories like that that make us all fearful. We're afraid to ask for God's will to be shown in our life because we're afraid that God is going to send us off to God only knows where. But it's true that just as the Magi set out unto the unknown, following our star always requires some kind of letting go of the familiar, of, 
of taking some risk, of venturing forth into new challenges, a new way of doing things, a new way of working. Not that any of those things have relevance for us here at the church in Aurora in the not too distant future. That was kind of a <laughs> joke. <laughs> Unless Bill's not leaving and then, yeah, we're, we're great. I am. <laughs> when you follow a star that's guiding you, you're not following somebody else's path. You have to find your own path. It's not like this well-defined road. And there's usually in those, in those treks some kind of desert. Man, it may be the loneliness of not following the crowd, the crowd that we argue about, but when they're not there, we feel pretty by ourselves. Or it may be giving up some of the rewards or the perks that come with playing the game that everybody seems to be playing. There's always some kind of desert to cross when you really follow one of God's stars. So why do it then? Why did the Magi do it? And, and why should we do it? I'd like to suggest that it's because we're all trying to, to do the same thing. We're all trying to find our way back home. Not the current house that we, we own, live in now, or even the family homestead from the past full of memories, but our real home. And that's a home that's far beyond any heavenly star. So is there a part of you that longs for something truer and deeper and more beautiful than, than the reality that we've created in this world? What is this home that we long for in the midst of kind of a mundane, ordinary life here? We're created for life. We're created for a relationship with God. And that relationship includes change. It includes loss. It even includes death. But that relationship also transcends all of these and more, even the death. These magi followed a star through the desert all the way to Bethlehem. And what did they find when they got there at the end of their trek? They, got, they found an amazing thing. They found this poor little child with absolutely no claims for himself. They gazed into this face of this, this helpless child who would fulfill his calling by doing several things, continuously relinquishing all the claims for himself, maintaining his pure openness to the heaven's light and truth no matter what the cost to him personally inviting us to enter the kingdom of God, which is sort of a way for us to experience the qualities of that eternal home while we're still living in our physical home. And probably most importantly, he would become for us our star, our light in the night sky that we can follow to find our way back home. Scripture does not tell us what happened to the Magi after their visit, other than going a different way back home. Tradition, again, offers some uh, suggestions, but, but we don't know. But I've got to think that after undertaking their ancient star trek and paying homage to the one that that star led them to, that their lives were changed, and not just in a small way. I have to believe that they certainly felt less threatened by these powers that had taken them captive. If they were probably less distracted by the temptations that surrounded them. And maybe even less defined by the world's expectations of who they were and what their call was. And I just I can't imagine that they weren't more tuned into the voice of God however God spoke to them. So, where does the story put us this morning? Is there a star that is calling or shining on you? It's calling you to venture out beyond your familiar security and to move closer to God. 
Have you looked into the face of Jesus? Not physically, but spiritually. And seen the face of a pure child of God. A face that each of us were created to have. And most important of all, are you following Jesus as your guiding light? Or is maybe this the year to start that ancient trek? Regardless, let's trek together, answering God's call and following the star that leads us home to God. Trek on and amen.